Today I'll be covering advances in myeloma treatments and also their implications for future development. This slide divides currently approved classes of antimyeloma agents into their six mechanisms of action. Uh, obviously, steroids and conventional chemo have been around for a long time, but it's really the remaining four classes that have uh, made an improvement in myeloma outcomes, including three immunomodulatory agents, thalidomide, LEN, and POM, the three proteasome inhibitors, bortezomib, carfilzomib, and exazomib, the HDAC inhibitor, panabinostat, and two monoclonal antibodies, daratumumab, which targets CD38, and ELO, which tar targets CS1. I think it's notable that four of these drugs were all approved in 2015, Exasmib, Pano, Dara, and Elo. And so um, this is great for patients that there's so much research happening, uh, but I think you'll see that we still need more. This is an interesting study that looked at what it takes to get a drug approved in myeloma. Ideally, we want to see single agent activity. And in this paper, they looked at over 400 drugs that had been identified to demonstrate preclinical cytotoxicity to myeloma cells. Notably, some drugs like IMIDs were not reliably predicted in rodent models, highlighting one of the limitations of preclinical work in myeloma. Uh, of the 129 drugs that were explored as, six, as single agents in 228 early phase studies involving many patients uh, between uh, 1961 and 2013, what uh, became apparent was that there needed to be a threshold response rate, which we define as partial response or better, uh, of 15% uh, mean and best overall response rate 20% in order to receive regulatory approval, and I would also emphasize widespread clinical use. Um, and we now know that these response rates will continually diminish with increasing lines of therapy and increasing uh, refractoriness to the currently available drugs. So in the overview of today's uh, topics, uh, we'll begin with CAR-T. This is a presentation by Dr. Berdeja et al. at uh, ASH and demonstrating durable clinical responses in heavily pretreated patients with relapsed refractory myeloma. This is the Bluebird study um, using the anti-BCMA CAR T cell te therapy. BCMA is a member of the TNF superfamily and it's expressed very highly in myeloma cells and less so in other cell, um, making it an ideal target for CAR T and other therapeutic uh, approaches. Um, there was initial preclinical um, activity, but uh, we know that there is the risk of cytokine release, as has been demonstrated with other CAR Ts that have already been approved for uh, ALL and diffuse large B cell lymphoma. Um, this slide shows the CAR T construct, um, which includes the BB2121 co-stimulatory domain. This is second generation CAR, and at the bottom are shown the preclinical activity um, demonstrating in mouse models the ability to really uh, improve survival significantly with this construct. One of the unique features of CAR-T that people may not be as familiar with and that really distinguishes this from other therapies is the logistics of having a patient undergo through uh, CAR-T. Um, so as with all clinical trials, they sign the consent and, and uh, undergo screening procedures. Then there's the leukophoresis process, after which the uh, BB2121 manufacturing goes on, and then the lymphodepletion is given with fludarabine and cyclophosphamide, followed by the BB2121 infusion, and then patients are uh, monitored for cytokine release for a minimum of approximately two weeks. And I'm emphasizing this because between screening to the CAR-T infusion, it can take anywhere from three to five weeks. And that's important because in most relapsed refractory myeloma studies, consenting to dosing is much shorter. And it means that there's a selection bias in the kinds of patients that are being enrolled and can actually get to the CAR-T infusion. Um, and so that's important when we think about this product, its generalizability, and the outcomes that we see. Here we see the baseline characteristics, um, and I'd like to mention I'm not going to go through every slide in complete detail, but rather highlight the salient features. The slides will be available to um, everybody on the webinar uh, for reading at their leisure. The important uh, baseline characteristics of this population are really shown first um, with the high-risk cytogenetics in the bottom left, 43% of the patients. Admittedly, this is a small number, 21 patients, but 43% had high-risk um, findings of deletion 17P, 
Translocation 414 or 1416. The other important um, feature of this slide is the median lines of prior therapy. This really distinguishes the Bluebird study from some of the other CAR-Ts that have been presented to date um, in, with a median of seven lines of prior therapy with all patients having had prior transplant. And shown at the bottom, 29% were the pentorefractory um, of the uh, two proteasome inhibitors, bortezomib and carfilzomib, the two imids, LEN and POM, as well as the CD38 antibody, DARA. As we know, cytokine release syndrome can be seen with CAR-T, and uh, this did occur um, in 71% of the patients, but it was grade 3 or higher in only 10%. Um, grade, severe neurotoxicity was not seen, although there were some low-grade neurotoxicities, and cytopenias were also common. Whether we use the PET scan or the serum M protein or free light chains, we can see that as the dose of the CAR-T product administered increased from 50 to 800 times 10 to the 6th, um, essentially other than the lowest dose, uh, responses were seen across the board, um, which is um, very exciting and encouraging for the population that we are enrolling in this study. Here we see the high frequency of deep and durable responses, uh, particularly as we go from the bottom to the top, we are increasing the dose of the CAR-T, and we see the arrows indicating in this uh, swimmer's lane plot that responses continue. Um, the purple uh, stars indicate MRD negativity. Um, so again, very encouraging results, um, and median PFS uh, had not yet been reached. Responses were rapid within one month, uh, deep, and the overall response rate was 100%, um, and with uh, updated data, 94%. Uh, I think, again, the uh, progression-free survival, even though the median was not reached, we see 81% with uh, progression-free survival at six months. Um, given the nature of this population, pentorefractory, including um, median of seven lines of prior therapy, uh, this is really, uh, really encouraging. This slide just summarizes what we've gone through with uh, impressive efficacy, uh, manageable safety, although, again, uh, both the safety and efficacy are limited by the small number of patients and limited follow-up, but uh, encouraging data with a global pivotal trial opening um, uh, by year-end of 2017. So what are my takeaways about CAR-T? The pros, obviously, this is a completely novel mechanism of action in myeloma with a novel target, the BCMA. These are unprecedented response rates in heavily pretreated patients, which is why I think uh, this was granted a breakthrough designation. The toxicity seemed to be manageable, although I would caution that this even grade one and two uh, cytokine release may not be easy to manage as an outpatient, and further work needs to be done to explore that. Um, and it's Outstanding efficacy results also highlight the possibility of moving it earlier with fewer lines of therapy and perhaps uh, even high-risk patients uh, very early on in their lines of therapy. What are the cons? As I alluded to, having a consenting to dosing time of four to six weeks results in a significant selection bias. There are many patients with relapsed refractory myeloma who simply cannot wait four to six weeks. And while bridging therapy is allowed, the bridging therapy has to be something that the patient has already seen before. It can't be a novel treatment. So when you have a pretty heavily pretreated patient, there may not be an easy bridging therapy. Secondly, the numbers are small. We know that there are relapses already occurring uh, across many of these CAR-T constructs, which raises the question of what is an acceptable PFS, particularly when we see the data coming out for the uh, antibody drug conjugates, which are ready to go off the shelf. Um, CRS, as I alluded to, is toxic, which then also will just, uh, limit its potential generalizability. Uh, we know that frail elderly patients are an unmet medical need. That might not be the population that will benefit from CAR-T in the near future, as a further safety uh, analysis will need to be done and uh, optimizing the modality. Um, protracted cytopenias have been seen with CAR-T, and finally, uh, as we all know, these are uh, expensive interventions with numerous competitors, both within pharmaceutical industry and also multiple academic institutions pursuing their own CAR-T constructs. Moving next to the GSK285-7916 uh, compound. 
This study was presented by Dr. Trudell on behalf of her colleagues at ASH 2017, and this is a monotherapy treatment with the GSK compound, an antibody drug conjugate against BCMA, preliminary results from part two of the DREAM-1 study. Similar to the CAR-T data that we just saw, this GSK compound also is targeting BCMA. However, this is a humanized, afucosylated IgG1 antibody, and it neutralizes soluble BCMA. Because of the afucosylation, it enhances ADCC, and the linker makes this uh, ADC stable in circulation, and it has the four different mechanisms of action shown on this slide. Overall, 38 patients were enrolled in this study, and uh, no DLTs were observed in Part 1. Um, part, two, uh, the, the part 2 is an expansion study uh, where the first cohort was myeloma patients. Um, and we can see the dose escalation schema shown here. And uh, Part 2 w enrollment, which is ongoing, is 3.4 milligrams per kilogram. Uh, again, I'm not going to go through all the details of the patient characteristics, but the salient points include that these had, uh, there were 91% of patients refractory to IMIDs, 97% refractory to PIs, 37 to DARA, and uh, nearly a third of patients were refractory to all three classes uh, with about 29% high-risk patients. The main toxicities are thrombocytopenia, and also, as has been seen with uh, several antibody drug uh, conjugates, uh, ocular toxicities have been noted. Um, blurry vision occurred in 46%, 34% dry eye, but only 3% uh, were more than grade 3. Impressively, the overall response rate in this population was 60%, and we see that even in the patients refractory to imid PI and prior DARA, we 42% uh, response rate. Uh, albeit, again, the numbers are small, uh, but highlighting the single agent efficacy of this uh, novel mechanism of action. In addition to the P, uh, overall response rate of 60%, the median PFS was 7.9 once, and the duration of response median was not even estimable uh, because only four patients had progressed. Um, and additional uh, enrollment is uh, ongoing in this study. Uh, both Janssen and Amgen have their own uh, BCMA targeting agents, uh, as shown on this slide, um, with uh, BCMA uh, in combination with CD3. So what are my takeaways from this GSK compound? Uh, well, clearly this is a novel target with a high response rate in a heavily pretreated pa patient population, also resulting in breakthrough designations similar to the Bluebird CAR-T. The toxicity seemed to be manageable, and this is an off-the-shelf product, so consent to dosing time is fast and typical of relapsed refractory clinical trials. The cons, small numbers, and a median PFS has already been noted. Um, secondly, even though the uh, ocular toxicities were not high-grade, chronic, even low-grade ocular toxicities can impact quality of life, and that needs to be further studied. Uh, and finally, if patients are treated with this compound, they can become ineligible for BCMA CAR-T, which could affect patient selection and sequencing of therapies. Moving next to the daratumumab subcutaneous administration. As we know, DARA has pleiotropic effects on both the tumor and the immune system. It has uh, rapid, deep, and durable responses, and primarily uh, manageable adverse events uh, being characterized as infusion-related reactions. It's uh, been approved in many countries, both as a single agent and also in combination with uh, bortezomib, lenalidomide, and in the U.S. also with pomalidomide. It was my privilege to present the uh, data with this new subcutaneous formulation at uh, this past year's ASH meeting. Uh, and hyaluronidase is important in the subcutaneous administration because large volumes of um, uh, antibodies cannot be administered uh, subcutaneously uh, due to the hyaluronic um, acid barrier. Um, and this enzyme breaks down that barrier, allowing drug to be given subcutaneously and systemically absorbed. Unlike what was presented at ASH 2016, this year I presented the data of the Part 2 so-called co-formulation. Co this is basically where the daratumumab subcutaneous administration has been co-formulated with the hyaluronic acid, unlike 
the previous mix and deliver, which required longer infusion times and a pump. This, re this new formulation uh, co-formula can be given within three to five minutes sub-Q manually with a volume of only 15 ml. As one might expect, when comparing the pharmacokinetics of IV to subcutaneous uh, daratumumab, the orange line shows IV uh, reaches higher systemic concentrations quickly. However, what's interesting is that uh, by the end of the first week, the, uh, the green line, which shows the daratumumab sub-Q co-formulate, has an uh, equal, if not higher, concentration. And this is important, as is shown on the next slide, because the Efficacy of daratumumab is really uh, related to the cycle three, day one trough level. And we can see that uh, at the end of the first eight weeks, the green line is actually running higher than the orange line, i.e. the subcutaneous uh, concentrations are better than the IV. This resulted in an impressive efficacy uh, rate of 44% overall response. Uh, although, again, small numbers of patients, uh, 25, and difficult to compare to um, prior studies. Um, median follow-up was 4.6 months. And other uh, equally important characteristic of this uh, formulation is the low rate of infusion-related reactions, only 12% 12% in this formulation compared to the typical 45 to 56% with uh, IV treatments in relapsed refractory myeloma. So why is this daratumumab subcutaneous formulation important? Well, we see that it has improved safety and pharmacokinetics, comparable efficacy, tremendously convenient for patients and nurses. Um, but importantly, for drug development, this is going to make daratumumab much easier to do in the maintenance setting, allow it to be used with, uh, for treatment to progression, and also make it easier to combine with other drugs. The cons, it has limited single-agent activity. It's still parenteral. The FDA did require a phase three study comparing IV versus sub-Q, and of course, the cost of doing these triplet and quadruplet um, regimens with novel agents. Next, we'll move to the uh, nuclear transport inhibitor known as Selenexor. Exportin-1, or XPO-1, is the exporter for tumor suppressor proteins, glucocorticoid receptor, and other oncoprotein mRNAs, and this compound blocks the egress of these proteins from the nucleus and therefore results in increased cell killing and had single-agent activity of 27% in heavily pretreated patients when given with steroids. Shown here are the phase two results uh, and that have been published in the Journal of Clinical Oncology with 79 relapsed refractory patients. Uh, 48 patients were refractory to four drugs, uh, which were the two IMIDs and the two PIs, and an additional 31 patients were so-called pentarefractory which included not only those four, but also CD38 antibody. The main toxicity as shown here are cytopenias and also some hyponatremia. The GI toxicity has also been observed. Impressively, even in this heavily pretreated population, there was a response rate seen, overall response rate 21% out of the 78, and um, apparent comparable appearing response rates in the quad and pentarefractory population. Uh, obviously, there's a lot of interest in high-risk patients, particularly 17P, where patients may have some amount of 17P and be uh, not necessarily completely absent of uh, this P53 gene. And uh, again, small numbers, but there was activity seen even in this population. Um, the median OS of this population was 9.3 months. The median PFS was uh, sh relatively short at 2.3 months. Obviously, the modest uh, PFS and response rates uh, beg the question of combination therapy, and so Selenexor is being explored, as shown on this slide, not only as a, uh, in combination with steroids, but also with bortezomib, carfilzomib, and pomalidomide. And preliminary data show encouraging response rates ranging from 60 to 77 percent and higher uh, clinical benefit rates as well. So yet again, we have a novel mechanism of action, an oral medication, possibly with a role in high-risk disease, although more data are needed. The cons, there's a fair amount of GI and heme toxicity, which will also affect its combinability, uh, raising the specter for next-generation XPO1 inhibitors. The PFS, unfortunately, was relatively short, and the response rates are modest when compared to the BCMA CAR-T and the antibody drug conjugate that we just saw. 
Moving next to our first attempt at personalized medicine in myeloma venita clax, both as monotherapy and in combination with bortezomib and dex. As we know, venita clax is a potent oral BCL2 inhibitor already approved for use in CLL. Uh, BCL2 expression we know is higher in patients with myeloma who have translocation 1114. Dr. Kumar presented the phase one results of venita clax monotherapy in 66 patients. This has been published in blood now, and the overall response rate in translocation 1114 was 40%, although in all patients, 21%, and of note, a disappointing only 6% in non-translocation 1114 are undetermined. Toxicities were primary, primarily hematologic. And this slide shows the potential use of biomarkers for drug development in myeloma with patients who had high BCL2 to BCL1 ratios showing improved response rates as well as progression-free survival. Given the relatively low prevalence of translocation 1114, however, uh, the question clearly becomes, is there a role for venetoclax in the non-1114 co uh, population? And for that combination strategy, which would be likely more appealing. And here we see Dr. Moreau's presentation with uh, venetoclax in combination with bortezomib and dex in a meeting of three lines of prior therapy. Here we see the preclinical rationale for combining venetoclax with bortezomib, which is that uh, MCL1 is a resistance factor for venetoclax, and bortezomib can actually block MCL1 via NOXA. Toxicities were primarily hematologic and the usual uh, side effects seen in relapsed refractory myeloma. Here we see that the overall response rate of this uh, triplet combination was 68%. Impressively, in uh, bortezomib non-refractory patients, it was 89%, particularly in um, those who had not been heavily pretreated. Uh, however, there was a, a signal seen of 24% even in bortezomib refractory patients, of whom there were 21 such patients. The duration of response was 8.8 .8 months, time to progression 8.6 months, uh, and uh, encouraging for this population. So what are the take-home messages of venetoclax? Well, it's already FDA approved, which makes it easier. Um, this is our first uh, targeted therapy in myeloma, uh, well-tolerated oral. The cons, as I alluded to, translocation 1114 is only present in approximately 15% of myeloma patients, and modest response rate, even with the addition of bortezomib and dexamethasone, in the bortezomib refractory population. We've all heard the... Uh, news about pembrolizumab in myeloma, and we'll look at the data here more closely. Pembrolizumab was uh, initially presented by uh, Dr. Osio in ASCO 2017 in combination with Lendex for relapsed refractory myeloma. However, it's important to note that PD PD-1 and PD-L1 blockade have been combined and studied in myeloma in many settings, including after transplant, with IMIDS, with DARA, and with ELO uh, and POMDEX. In this study, Pembro was given 200 milligrams Q2 weeks with standard Lendex in a median of four lines of prior therapy. Importantly, 75% of patients were Len refractory. And this is important because Pembro has no single agent activity in myeloma, and it's this population that could potentially show a signal of the addition of Pembro. And we see that the overall response rate was 50%, but included 38% in the Len refractory population. Admittedly, Len refractory is a difficult uh, thing to define given that LEN can be given at maintenance doses of 10 milligram up to 25 milligrams. However, encouraging preliminary data also came from Badros paper in blood 2017, which combined the same Pembro dosing with pomalidomide and dexamethasone. And here we saw an overall response rate of 60% in a population with a median of three lines of therapy, including nearly three quarters of patients who were double refractory to PI and IMID. Equally, and if perhaps more encouraging, is the PFS of 17.4 months, uh, which is one of the longest I've seen in this population with a palm dex backbone. The toxicities are shown on the right, and primarily at the top are the hematologic toxicities. However, the other toxicities are listed, and 11% of patients in the study discontinued treatment due to toxicity and immune-mediated events, which were primarily grade one and two, um, and resolved with interruption of therapy or steroids. So what happened? 
On the left, we see POMDEX plus minus PEMBRO in a relapse refractory myeloma. This was a phase three study and a companion study in newly diagnosed patients with LENDEX plus minus PEMBRO. And unfortunately, both studies had to be halted because the addition of PEMBRO actually worsened overall survival. There was increased risk of non-myeloma deaths due to cardiac, respiratory, intestinal issues, and infections. And I think this is an important lesson for drug development and highlights the importance of phase three studies to separate and control the effects of patient and disease factors from treatment-related effects. So what are the take-home messages from the PEMBRO story in myeloma? Well, the pros are these checkpoint inhibitors are already FDA approved for other uh, diseases. Uh, we see encouraging efficacy when added to LEN refractory and POM naive patients, minimal hematologic toxicity, and interestingly, the OS signal that was seen with the two PEMBRO studies has not yet been seen in other phase three studies to date. The cons, of course, are this clear increase in the risk of deaths in two large studies, which, which highlights the importance of vigilance for toxicity with early and aggressive interventions. And secondly, the FDA has now mandated that IMID-based studies with checkpoint inhibitors must be done with A, a control arm, and B, in patients with advanced disease. Moving to minimal residual disease testing, this iceberg type of picture highlights the fact that when patients are newly diagnosed, the disease burden is quite apparent with CRAB symptoms, and then with serologic testing, we can get down to a complete response. But as with other hematologic malignancies, we need to go deeper because especially when we start doing more than triplet regimens and getting to quadruplet, what additional benefit will we get if we don't use more sensitive diagnostic and uh, monitoring techniques? So we've seen that both um, PCR and flow-based assays can get us to MRD negativity uh, at approximately as high as 10, 1 in 10 to the minus 6. The limitation, however, of doing MRD testing in myeloma from the bone marrow is that patients can have macrofocal disease, and as shown at the bottom, patients could have MRI or PET showing resist, residual disease radiologically, but with a single sample from the marrow, that may not be detected. And for that reason, there's a lot of interest in circulating tumor cells and uh, cell-free DNA. Uh, however, those are still under investigation. Why is this so important? Well, here's a great, great example from the uh, RVD ver with early versus delayed transplant presented by the IFM group and uh, published in New England Journal. What we found was that MRD negativity, as expected, results in better uh, progression-free survival, uh, both with RVD and transplant. However, the difference is that the rates of MRD or the frequency of attaining MRD negativity are going to be higher with, with the transplant arm than with a non-transplant approach. But what's interesting is that it appears that if you do attain MRD negativity with RVD, perhaps the role of transplant is not as clear, and this would help guide uh, future therapeutic decisions, particularly for early disease state. In a meta-analysis of 14 studies, MRD negativity consistently correlated with PFS and OS. One of the limitations, however, though, is only one study showed that MRD negativity was able to overcome unfavorable cytogenetics. In other words, both high-risk and low-risk patients can attain MRD negativity, but high-risk patients will still relapse faster and uh, more frequently than low-risk patients. So what is the role of MRD? It gives us prognostic information, correlates with clinical benefit, and we think it will likely be used as a surrogate for drug approval in earlier disease states, such as newly diagnosed patients and maintenance. However, it doesn't really add much in heavily pretreated patients because the fact of the matter is very few patients get to a CR. And there, the PFS and OS are going to be easily demonstrable without the use of a surrogate. And as I alluded to, combination therapies will be interesting to see if we're getting higher rates of MRD negativity. What are the cautions? There's a lot of issues with sensitivity, and it depends on particularly with flow, the quality of the aspirate. With the PCR, you need the baseline clone. Standardization needs to be addressed. The applicability to each patient, for example, if the patient doesn't have their baseline characteristics or baseline clone identified, PCR may not be easily done. Its utility in high-risk patients is uh, unclear relative to standard risk, uh, and that also relates to risk-adapted therapy. Should we intensify if somebody's MRD positive, de-intensify de or stop therapy if MRD is negative? Should patients who convert from MRD negative to positive start treatment? 
These are all important unanswered questions. So we've covered a lot, and the question is, what's left? Are we done with myeloma therapeutics? This slide shows the various factors that we consider in selecting therapies and in evaluating outcomes. We have patient issues, disease-related issues, and treatment-related issues. I would submit that some of the areas that we still have not improved outcomes in, and these are the patients whose median overall survivals are really still falling below the median, include older, frail patients, patients with renal insufficiency, extramedullary disease, and high molecular risk patients. So should we all go after those high-risk patients? Is that easy to do? I would argue it's not straightforward. Um, this is from a review paper uh, that was written by one of my residents with me, and we looked at all of the recent phase three studies published, and we looked at what is the percentage of patients in each study that was over 75, what was the ISS stage that was greater than three, what percentage of patients, median lines of therapy, refractory to PI and IMID, the definition of high risk, what percentage of 17P deletion, because we know that 5% is not necessarily high risk, 70% certainly is, what percentage of patients had the high risk uh, data available, what percentage were missing. And while these numbers and figures are small, the point isn't to necessarily look at the actual numbers, but the summary statement is that all novel therapies resulted in an improved progression for survival for high risk patients, but none provided clear statistical evidence that they overcame high risk. And this applies to carfilzomib, panabinostat, ixazomib, daratumumab, elotuzumab, and especially when you drill down to the truly high-risk patients, consistently, they're still doing worse. So how do we do and how do we demonstrate the ability to overcome high-risk disease? Well, you can't just do a randomized phase two study. As shown in panel A, it might look that standard risk patients with conventional therapy will do uh, better than high-risk patients. But to truly demonstrate what's going on with novel therapy, we need a randomized phase three study where all four groups are represented, standard risk and high risk, but also conventional therapy and investigational therapy. And what we see there is in panel B that investigational therapy could potentially worsen high risk outcomes, and that's thalidomide and deletion 17P. Some studies show that the high risk patients do uh, better, but not quite as good as standard risk patients with investigational therapy. Probably the best example of this would be proteasome inhibitors in 414, but our goal is really panel D, where high-risk patients end up doing just the same as standard risk, and that is yet to be seen. So to summarize, there's a lot of exciting new advances in myeloma, CAR-T, outstanding response rates, encouraging PFS, but small numbers, and the question is, what will be these numbers what will these numbers be in real-world patients, and particularly the cost and feasibility of this modality? The GSK BCMA antibody drug conjugate, if the response rates in PFS are supported with larger sample size and the ocular toxicity is manageable, this will likely result in rapid approval and be a great option for patients. DARA sub-Q is going to be a game-changer for patients in terms of the time they're going to be spending in the infusion center for nurses and for private practice doctors who are trying to manage their infusion chairs. Cell and XOR, a single agent versus combination therapy, is going to depend on the response rate in PFS in larger numbers and its toxicity profile. Venetoclax is promising as the first targeted therapy in multiple myeloma in the 1114 pop population. Pembro, to me, these studies show that IMIDs are, in fact, immunomodulatory, and it also highlights the importance of phase three design and toxicity management and site selection. Uh, and perhaps those are some of the reasons why the toxicity has not been seen with all checkpoint inhibitors to date. MRD negativity is an important endpoint, uh, and once standardized, could be a surrogate for early disease state outcomes and early drug approvals. Its impact, however, on changing therapy is yet to be seen and requires further investigation. And finally, we still have a lot of unmet medical needs in myeloma, but often with patient populations that are not well represented in trials, and this makes study design challenging, but definitely worth pursuing, and patients are still in dire need of new therapeutics. 